I was speaking with somebody recently in person, and I asked them their opinion on astrology. They were quite skeptical, as I would come to find out about most, if not all, things esoteric. Even some of the foundational material of quantum physics, and raising important questions about the nature of whether or not a conscious observer had any influence over the measurement of particles or waves or phenomenon. Because it seemed completely implausible to them that the mere act of observing with a conscious essence could impact anything. And they reasoned that it was likely some interference from electrical equipment. We would have further discussions about the nature of reality and things of that sort. And I found them to be very strapped to our three dimensional world. If you think of Plato's cave, they were like deep in the middle of Plato's cave. And it was interesting because I got to reflect on myself. They are a technical field. They have a career in computers and very, 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 very logical, rational, critically oriented person, data-driven evidence base. I can relate being a former scientist. So understandably, when I asked them, their opinion on astrology, they were incredibly skeptical. But I continued anyway and shared my thoughts about it, also having been on their side of things, deep in Plato's cave, without any understanding of esoteric anything or how people could be scientists and believe in a higher power. So, I explained that I believed that everything was energy and that molecules were vibrating in accordance to a resonant frequency. This is why sound is so powerful. Because we can literally affect the matter, the aggregate of matter, and pull things into creation, not just with our conscious intent, our willpower, and what we're speaking but actually the vibration behind it. It's one of the reasons in my coaching practice, I love using voice messages because you can transmit and receive different levels of information. Because we're all energy, I was telling him, in my view, everything holds a frequency. We're just in our meat suits, often not aware of this level of information processing because we are so focused on our life, on our tasks, and moving about our goals in an orderly fashion. Maybe not so orderly for those that are a little more chaotic, but you get my point. So as a result, our working model of reality usually doesn't compute that everything has frequency to it, even inanimate objects. And bodies of mass, including planets, can, through their energetic field, influence other beings. And I reasoned that the blueprint in the sky was almost like an energetic imprintation on an individual who was born in with a archetype. This is sort of pulling many different ideas together. But there are these shared archetypes. Jungian astrology, or Jung is very much about that, but also astrology is about that as well. There are a certain number of archetypes and a variety of different combinations therein. So it can get rather complex. And depending on your script, 
that you were born with. Every baby has an innate personality, and then the environment influences them, depending on your script and how you are impacted by the energetic frequency of when you were born. This is how I believe that astrology can be rather predictable up into a point. That is, when we are unconscious and we're just ball of reactions and triggers and wounds, then astrology is incredibly predictable. But I have found that as you progress through the awakening journey, it becomes less so because you master certain aspects of your shadow, certain areas of your persona, and you rebuild yourself consciously so you no longer are a byproduct of your genes and your environment. You actually create yourself. So as we were talking, I would come to discover just how grounded this person was in the 3D world. And for those of you who follow along, this is a soul contract that I mentioned in my rejection episode, the last episode, where if you haven't been following the story, I have been out on walks with my little one in the evenings and there's been a person that has been in my periphery over the last couple of years. Never really talked to them. And slowly over time, as I've been talking to other people, there have been these encounters where it's like a triad will come together and start talking. So I'm talking to person A and they are also familiar with person A. So then we just sort of aggregate together and then conversations have happened. But when I realized that there was a magnetism of a soul contract, recently I started to explore it. But when I explored it, I found that it was challenging to talk to them and for them to talk to me. We have since overcome that and have now had multiple conversations. And I'm not quite sure what the soul contract is about because, for example, I asked them if they meditate and if they could sense energy because I could feel them before I could see them. So if I was at this park, I would actually feel them right before they would come over the little hill, if there was a hill. And, or I would just be doing my thing, focused on my world, and I would feel their presence, and I would look up, and they would be there. And similarly, I could feel them when we were not always in communication or in proximity. And I didn't know if they could feel me too, because I happen to be very sensitive to energy now. But when you're earlier on the awakening journey, particularly if you haven't meditated or if you don't practice Tai Chi or Qigong or Nigong or Reiki, then you wouldn't necessarily have developed the skill because it is a skill. And so when I asked them if they meditated and if they felt energy, they didn't. <laughs> and it appeared to me that they were in fact not awake to any of that. So yet I could feel that they were also responding to the magnetism. So there was some level of processing of that. But it didn't seem like their sensory system was developed enough to be in tune with everything that I was feeling. So in exploring the soul contract, what I came to realize is that they were rather an underdeveloped human, in my personal opinion. Meaning, they were still very, very deeply entrenched in the 3D world and were largely unawake to these other abilities and largely unawake to the value of creation and expression seeing their 
ridiculous talent in music as almost uh, something to be discarded in lieu of being productive because they were very tied to this rat race mentality of growing a career. And to be fair, where they're at, they need that level of dedication and focus. So that's, I think, prioritization. But the way they spoke about music and making art was almost with disdain. Like, they get so into it, particularly under certain conditions, and then they have to go back and be productive. Almost as though the very act of making art was not something that was sacred to them at all, and not something worthwhile to pursue, even though the resonance of their music was incredible and very, very special. And so as I was speaking with them, I started to realize that they turned away from specialness. They turned away from the magic of the world. And even if they felt what I felt in terms of the potential of the soul contract, it's doubtful that they would even allow it because of the specialness that it would contain. So, for example, in our astrology conversation, I was asking them about something, like if they had experience with it, or I can't remember how we got here, but they said that usually when they read paragraphs explaining their sun sign details, it was so fascinating to hear this, that it's so good that it inflates their ego. They said it in their own way. And I almost got the sense that they were dead set on maintaining this self-image that they were not special, that they were not remarkable. Because seeing that written in their astrology report would do something to them and push them out of their comfort zone is what I inferred. But to their point, and to be fair to them, they were saying that there's confirmation bias, that people want to feel good. And so a lot of the astrology reports will try to make you feel good, but everybody can latch onto that because they just want to feel good. And although I do accept their argument there, I also found that they struggle with seeing themselves highly. And so when I say underdeveloped human, this is what I mean, that there's some narrative that they're still carrying around from the past that perhaps was given to them from childhood, perhaps um, a wounded masculine. And as a result, the way that they see themselves and categorize themselves is very, very negative, somebody that has to prove a lot. And as a result, this creates this hypercritical nature in them, which wants to find the absolute truth and not be open to anything that colors outside of Plato's cave because it's bullshit. And there's almost this weight to that criticism, poking holes in arguments and poking holes in even world-leading scientists like quantum physicists, because how could it be possible that a conscious observer could influence the outcome of anything? Just the mere act of your consciousness and presence affecting something is so inconceivable that it must be some overlooked flaw in the experimental design, such as the cameras or the electrical equipment which radiate its own electrical field absolutely true. And so do humans. So do humans. And we are effervescently always connecting with and merging with, pushing against our environment, the inanimate objects, as well as the people and the beings which are in our presence. 
And when you start to raise your vibration, you can literally observe your houseplants raise up to greet you as if they are stretching and straining against the stems and their confines to touch you, to get a little closer to you just by being energetically active and really with a high frequency that is so attractive that will bring children and wild animals to your doorstep. I've heard crazy stories. There is something powerfully magnetic about our biofield, but traditionally speaking, we don't, and things are changing, and it's been a while since I've been in graduate school, we don't honor it as anything remarkable, and especially not sacred. As a result, the way that we parse reality and deconstruct it and interact with it is dry and data-driven and empirical and it makes us feel good to be right it makes us feel good to pull a rabbit out of the hat when we predict it and when we can hypothesize and come up with this theory of why it all works but it doesn't feel as comfortable to see or hear stories of random people pulling rabbits out of the hat who have no training whatsoever and are not scientists or mathematicians, physicists. So as a result, it challenges us on these ideas of what it means to be credible. And so when people start talking about what's beyond Plato's cave, it's actually true, the allegory is true that those inside the cave that have never actually emerged are deeply troubled by this and very often poke fun or ostracize or in some cases intimidate into silence, withdraw funding, withdraw respect, mount campaigns against somebody's reputation, so on and so forth. But my whole point to this person was that because science and mathematics and all of the instruments therein are designed to help us look inside the cave, anything that is outside is going to seem like magic at first because we're all focused on the inside. And all of the tools, all of the instruments are calibrated for the conditions inside the cave. And when we start stepping outside of space-time, as Dr. Donald Hoffman suggests, that space-time itself is an illusion, and maybe not an illusion, but it's its own box, it's its own container, we're starting to understand that there's something beyond space-time. We're starting to understand that there are dimensions crazy things about geometry that while we were looking inside of our box, inside of our cave, we just thought was erroneous results if we even caught it. Now we're starting to realize that there are things that break our concept of reality, which are emerging in modern day science. And before it started emerging in modern day science. There were mystics and those who were not in the establishment that were trying to communicate about some of these principles, but were thought of as just unremarkable drivel, unless you respected that particular religion or secret teaching or whatever it was. And it takes a wave to crash upon the shore to move the sand. The sand does not move on its own. And so 
when knowledge comes to us, it comes to us through a wave, often first in the esoteric reaches and arms of society. And as it gathers momentum and trickles into mainstream, then eventually scientists and other sorts of people in the establishment and ivory towers will start to have questions about it. And at some point, those questions will become so legitimate that new instruments will be created, new experimental designs and approaches will be thought of, and then the engine of science will start to elucidate some of the mysteries that have been in front of our eyes the entire time. And so when we are looking to the esoteric, we are looking to the leading edge of knowledge. And of course, there are some things out there that don't make sense and that are too far out there or are actual just nonsense. But when we awaken to the specialness of the universe, we tune our eyes to that frequency. We, this person and I, had a conversation, tangent at the end, talking about how the reticular activating system works and how when we tune our eyes and our perceptual experience to the things that we desire, the things that we want, then we observe more of it and that reinforces what we want to come in. When we are conscious about it and intentional, we can tune to our manifestations. That's how manifestation works. We have to train our brain. They intuitively understood and agreed with this, believing in the power of positive thinking and also having the mental discipline to be sure that they orient their brain to success is what they were inferring, but they said it a little differently. I closed the conversation with a statement that I've oriented my brain to the magic of the universe and look for the leading edge of things in the esoteric because this life is so empty without that, so empty without purpose, without meaning. It's just a rigmarole of this continuous onslaught of material goods and consumption and ideas and politics and even travel becomes the same after a while. There's always culture, there's always people, there's always food, there's always division. And yes, some of the details change, but fundamentally it's all the same. When you strip away all of the identifying details and you just look at the patterns and the noise and the frequency, what you'll find is that ad like ad nauseum, it just repeats over and over and over again and becomes this endless quest for the next novel experience to stimulate and tickle the senses, to alleviate the sense of gnawing boredom that many people that are not spiritually attuned have, myself included back in the day. And yes, there are always more mountains to climb and parties to go to and places and countries to visit. But when you have such an emptiness inside of you, everything is fleeting and nothing is special. Not really. Specialty is wrapped up in the novelty, which is often a neurochemical and hormonal experience more than a lasting paradigm shift. That many are actually hoping for. So when we tune our brain to accept the specialness, to want the specialness, to crave the specialness, then we open ourselves up to exactly that. We find ourselves deep in the waters of the unknown and the esoteric, where few dare to go 
but those of you on my channel are definitely in this category of explorers of the unknown, explorers of the magic, often raising more questions and answers, but titillating all of the same.